So I'll be speaking about some work I did uh, a few weeks ago, actually, uh, on the uh, uh, on discrepancy theory. Um, So discrepancy theory, roughly speaking, is a study of how well balanced or well distributed uh, you can make various sequences uh, or, uh, of numbers or points, uh, things like that. Uh, so for instance, you can consider plus or minus one sequences. Suppose you have a sequence of numbers which are either minus one or plus one, so um, some, some signs. Um, and you want to make the sequence sort of roughly, uh, so the rough question is of how balanced, how well balanced. Can you make such a sequence? Okay, like you want the minus ones and plus ones to be in, in uh, very um, equally distributed uh, in, in, in some sense. Now, of course, this is not a well-defined question because I haven't told you what well balanced means. Um, so, for example, a, a very naive thing is that you can take uh, consecutive values. You, you, you can sum, you know, you can take partial sums from uh, on, on various blocks, and you can ask, can you make um, um, all the partial sums um, small? And, and this is very easy. Um, I can make all the partial sums, in fact, less than one. Right, simply by choosing the outnaming sequence. Okay, so this is a sequence where, if, if, if you look at any interval, um, uh, the discrepancy is, is, is ex almost as small as it can be. Um, OK, so this is much better, by the way, than a random sequence. If you, you flip coins and you pick a plus minus one sequence randomly, then um, in any block of length n, you expect um, to, to be able to find uh, some subblock where, where the, uh, the sum is about root n, maybe up to a log factor. Uh, but you can make it bounded. OK, so this is not a, a, an interesting question. Um, it's more interesting if you uh, ask for stronger notions of, of discrepancy, where you don't just um, ask that um, partial sums are small, but also sums in arithmetic pro progressions. Um, and once you do that, then uh, it becomes um, a lot harder uh, to make the discrepancy small. Uh, so for example, there's a classical result of van der Waarden. Um, I think in the 19th century, um, that uh, says that, um, that you can find, okay, find arbitrarily long ethnic progressions. A, A plus R plus 2R up to, say, A plus K minus 1R, where there is no uh, cancellation at all, where, where all of these guys are the same. Are the same. OK, so in other words, if you sum uh, the sequence, if you look at it in this particular progression, so yeah, so uh, given any infinite sequence of plus minus ones, you can find arbitrarily long progressions where um, uh, where the sum is as big as it can be. There is, there is no cancellation. That, 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 all the, uh, that uh, if, I, uh, if I look, for example, if k is 100, I can find a progression on length 100 where all the, um, in this progression, you just get all plus ones or all minus ones. So, there's no, so the discrepancy can get arbitrarily big in particular. Um, OK, uh, very famously, there was a strengthening of this uh, theorem due to Zemmeretti. So uh, this theorem tells you that, uh, that you can find progressions where um, all the entries are either colored plus one or colored minus one, but it doesn't tell you which one. Uh, but Zemmeretti's theorem is, is a strengthening, uh, proven in 75, um, which is the year I was born, actually, um, to, um, 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 uh, which tells you sort of which sign that you can make. So, um, so Murray's theorem says that if, for example, if you know that, that uh, plus ones occur uh, fairly often, if plus ones occur for a positive density, uh, strictly speaking, positive um, upper density, but never mind what that means. So like if, if, if your sequence is plus one even 0.1% of the time, um, then, uh, then you can find uh, progressions, as before, where now all the signs are plus one. Um, so that's a great theorem. Um, I think at least three Fjords medals won Arbor Prize came out of that theorem. <laughs> but anyway, um, OK. But um, all right, so, uh, so we have that theorem. Um, another notable theorem is a Roth discrepancy theorem. Uh, 
oh, which is a bit more quantitative, um, what it tells you is, is that if you have a sequence, uh, but now a finite sequence of plus and minus ones, okay, then inside the sequence you can find uh, an arithmetic progression inside the sequence. where um, on, this, on, on this sequence, the discrepancy is fairly large. Uh, let's say A plus JR. So if you sum up your elements in the sequence, um, uh, K minus 1, there is some arithmetic progression where there's a lot of imbalance. Now, this, this, this sum is actually pretty big. It's actually, um, I think the boundary you get is, is n to the 1 quarter times the constant, which you can take to be 1 20th, for instance. It's not, the constant's not important. But uh, you can find a sequence somewhere where there was, there was actually quite a bit of imbalance, n to the one quarter. Um, and this n to the one quarter is actually the optimal exponent, uh, although we don't have, a, have an explicit construction, actually, of, uh, uh, of a sequence that does that. We, we, but we know that it can't be improved. It's kind of a weird situation. But yeah, so if you, if you, um, if you allow all progressions, if, if, if you want, so what, what this is telling you is that it is actually not possible to have a, um, a sequence, a long sequence, which is well balanced in every single arithmetic progression. There must be some arithmetic progression where the plus ones and minus ones are out of balance. So there is some limit as to how well distributed uh, you, can, you can make sequences if you allow all <coughs> arithmetic progressions. OK, so way back in the 1930s, um, Paul Erdős was very interested in these questions. Um, for example, he conjectured Zemmerides' theorem, um, which turned out to be true. Um, and so um, he knew about Ross' theorem. Um, uh, that uh, that you had to, um, that if you allow all progressions, um, then somewhere you you must get um, a very big sum. Um, so his the question he asked was that suppose you 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 um, you don't look at all progressions, but you look at what are called homogeneous arithmetic progressions, which start which start say at zero, or, um, where, where a is zero. Um, so let me phrase it this way. Okay. So uh, the Erdős discrepancy problem. So that, that if, uh, you know, let's phrase it first for an infinite sequence. If you have an infinite sequence of plus and minus ones, um, uh, <coughs> are the sums, uh, let's call them, let's say, f of jd, from j equals 1 to n, are these sums. So in other words, f of d plus f of 2d plus f of nd, always unbounded. So uh, Ross theorem, or actually also Zemmerides theorem, or Van der Waals theorem, any of these theorems tell you that you, you can make uh, if, um, that if you have a long enough sequence, you can you can find um, some arithmetic progression where uh, the sum is large. But now, if you restrict to the homogeneous arithmetic progressions, the, the ones that, that that start at zero, basically t uh, d, two d, up to up to n d, can you make um, uh, 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 can you can you make uh, um, uh, this sequence uh, this, this sequence large? Um, so uh, an equivalent way to, to phrase this question, um, equivalently. Okay. So given any c, uh, does there exist an n? Okay. So given any constant c, does there exist an n such that every sequence, every finite sequence now, f of one to f of n, of plus ones and minus ones, such that for every sequence. Um, there is uh, now a homogeneous arithmetic progression, n 2d up to uh, nd, somewhere in this range, uh, such that uh, if you sum up all these values, you get bigger than c. Um, OK, so uh, actually, there's a YouTube video of, uh, of someone explaining uh, this uh, using a pit of snakes and a cliff. Um, we will repeat this. Cause, um, so the, uh, uh, the the reformulation is that you've been captured by some sadistic torturer, and um, and you're, you're placed at the origin of this uh, uh, of, of 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 some one-dimensional line, uh, and then there's a cliff here at some at, at some point C where you you'll fall off and die. Uh, and then there's, there's, there's also at minus C, this, okay, well, he put a, a, a pit of venomous snakes, okay, which, which would also kill you, okay, but whatever, okay. <laughs> All right, I can't draw a snake, okay. Um, 
and you're here. Okay. And what you have to submit to the torturer is, is, is a sequence of, of, of moves, you can, uh, of, of left and right moves. Okay. And you just submit a, a long list of lefts and rights. Um, and then once you give them the, um, the, uh, that to the torturer, the torturer will then force you to move right or left according to, to the instructions you gave, except that the, uh, the, the torturer may not give, um, um, the, tor the torturer gets to choose. Either he, he gets to, to, uh, to, to, um, to give you the sequence, um, um, all the elements of the sequence, or he'll only give every second element of the sequence, or every third element of the sequence, or every fourth element of the sequence. So he gets to pick a skip, um, and then he will force you to move right or left according to the sequence. And uh, your task is 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 to find a a, uh, um, a chain of, uh, of lessons and rights, which will let you survive no matter what the torturer um, chooses for you. Okay, so this is an equivalent formulation. It's kind of quite colorful. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, um, this is kind of so. One nice thing about this equivalent formulation is that, is that you can attack it numerically. You, know, you can pick specific guys of C, like 1 and 2 and 3 and so forth, and then you can, you can see what happens. So for instance, um, if C is 1, uh, you're actually in really bad shape. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, you, gotta, uh, yeah, you can take N equals 1. You, you'll die as soon as you submit a single step, uh, which is pretty clear. Um, if C is 2, um, then actually you can survive for quite a while. Um, there, there, there was a sequence of 11 steps uh, that you can submit such that, uh, uh, which I, I didn't write down, but you can find it, uh, where, it, in fact, it's, it's basically unique uh, up, to, up to sign, uh, which will let you live for um, um, uh, no matter what, uh, uh, what you pick here. So that's, that's if you have a, a, a width 2 margin. Uh, but 11 is sharp. Uh, if you have 12, actually, a fun little exercise, actually, uh, almost like solving a Sudoku puzzle, um, to show that, that, uh, that if you submit 12, uh, then, then, then you are toast. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, 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 so 11 is, is the sharp. Um, C equals 3, uh, things are ready. Uh, you can now survive for quite a long time. So uh, this was actually worked out uh, last year. Uh, so uh, there, was, um, there was this amazing uh, uh, computational work of Kondova and Lesitsa in last year, who did this massive three sat problem, uh, which is what this is basically. Um, and uh, what they found uh, was that uh, was that the optimal n in this case was uh, what, 1161. So first of all, they found a sequence of length 1161 with the property that, that no matter what skip size you pick, you, you can always survive it for, for this particular choice of C, <laughs> which was really amazing. But like, even, even more amazing is that they showed but there's this massive three set combination that, that, that 1162, uh, you, you could not uh, uh, survive. Um, and the verification uh, of, of, that, uh, of that argument is, is, is a file which is, I think, what, uh, 13 gigabytes, uh, which, which uh, uh, so uh, the, 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 the media picked up on this. This is, this is, this is a proof that's larger than Wikipedia. Um, and in, in some sense, it is the largest proof known of, of, of uh, uh, of, of, of a, you know, uh, in a serious mathematical uh, publication. Okay, um, yeah, okay, now C equals four. Uh, we don't know what, exactly what the, the sharp value of N is, but it is at least 13,000. That uh, the same authors did construct a sequence of length 13,000, which had discrepancy uh, at most four, uh, which means that all these partial sums are at most four. Um, okay, so it's, um, so you can see that this, it, it goes quite slowly. Um, you know, I mean, and, and you, you have to pick your sequence quite carefully. If you pick a random sequence um, of length n, your discrepancy is going to be about root n, and so you, you will not get anything nearly as good as this. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, so about uh, two, three weeks ago maybe? Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, I proved this theorem. So, so uh, the answer is yes, um, that, that these sums are always unbounded. Or in other words, for, for, for every c, there is a finite n. Um, uh, for which uh, for, for which the discrepancy must be bigger than C. Okay, so let me tell you about the type of things that go into the proof. So this problem has been attacked quite a lot in the past, actually. Um, most recently, well, there's this computational attack, but. Um, from about 2010 to 2012, uh, there was also a, a serious attempt uh, at, at, at proof by uh, what's called the Polymath Project. This was actually the fifth Polymath, polymath Project, which was, what was called Polymath 5. Um, it was run by Tim Gowers. 
So a polymath project is a project run online using things like, like blogs and wikis and math overflow, actually, um, where um, instead of having one or two people working sort of secretly or you know, not, not, at least not publicly on these problems, you, you do everything out in the open. So, so you know, um, every thought that anyone has, you just throw it out there, even if it's half-baked, actually especially if it's half-baked, and then someone will, will pick up on it. So there was always numerical computations, and people tried throwing out all these different ideas. Um, and they didn't solve the problem. Um, but they made um, a lot of progress in suggesting, uh, or they found various equivalent forms of the problem, and uh, they suggested various attack strategies um, to, to attack this problem. Um, and, and it was one of those strategies that, uh, so th th there were many that, that actually looked promising. Um, and one of them actually uh, was one, one that I used, uh, a sort of a Fourier analytic approach, um, which at the time uh, looked hopeless because it reduced the problem to what at the time looked like an unsolvable problem in multiplicative number theory. Um, but then in January this year, there was a big breakthrough in multiplicative number theory. Uh, on, um, and that uh, actually uh, took a while to realize, but that combined with the previous thing was what was needed to, to finish off the problem. Uh, plus a new idea, which I'll talk about later. So um, one of the things uh, they formalized uh, was a reduction of the problem to uh, multiplicative functions. So actually, uh, I should say, uh, before I say that, let me say some, one other thing. So um, this is a sequence about plus minus one sequen sequences. Um, you can ask about other sequences. Of course, you need some lower bound on the sequence. Like if the sequence is all zeros, so of course, you can make discrepancy um, uh, and zero. Um, so actually, what I prove is a, is, a, is a more general version. So in fact, what is known now, that if you have, uh, if, uh, you have a sequence not just plus or minus one, but, but you can live in the unit sphere of any Hilbert space, real or complex, then all these sums are unbounded. So, so now these are vectors. You take the normal of this vector in your Hilbert space. You take a super for all d and n. This is infinite. OK, so the original problem is just a special case when you take the real Hilbert space r. But you can take, for example, complex numbers in your circle or vectors or whatever. Um, so th uh, this is actually what I prove. Um, so already in, uh, when Erdős formulated the problem back in the 1930s, he realized that there was a key special case of this problem. So um, on one hand, this problem is, it should be sort of easy because it, 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 it should be very difficult to create a low discrepancy sequence because there's lots and lots of different partial sums you can make. There's, there's two parameters, n and d. And so most sequences that you write down will have large discrepancy. For example, a random sequence will have a large discrepancy. Um, but um, there's a special class of sequences for which um, it should be a lot easier to make a low discrepancy sequence, and hence, um, those should be among the hardest cases. And those are what are called the completely multiplicative functions. So just to remind you, a function with natural numbers to the, uh, let's say, the, uh, um, the unit circle is simply completely multiplicative. Actually, complex numbers, but more general. If f of n m is equal to f of n times f of m, or n and f. Okay, for example, f of 15 is f of 3 times f of 5. Um, so examples of multiplicative sequences, so the trivial one is the, sequ the all one sequence. Um, and um, another important class in number, so, so these show a lot in number theory. Um, uh, an important class are, are Dirichlet characters. Uh, these are, these are complete multiplicative functions that are also periodic. Uh, so I'll just give you one example. Uh, if you take the this, this, this sequence, which is uh, plus 1 when n is 1 mod 3, <coughs> 0 when n is 2 mod 3, sorry, minus 1 when n is 2 mod 3, um, and 0 when n is 0 mod 3. So the sequence 1 minus 1, 0, 1 minus 1, 0 uh, periodically, this is a completely multiplicative sequence. Um, another important example is what's called the Luvo, Luvo function. lambda of n, which is minus 1 of the number of prime factors. Of n, counting multiplicity. So lambda of 6 is plus 1, lambda of 4 is plus 1, lambda of 12 is minus 1, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's also completely multiplicative. These are some examples of completely multiplicative functions. So um, one corollary of, uh, of this theorem is that it, uh, see, if your function is also 
completely multiplicative, then this f of d can be factored out. So one corollary is that if f uh, taking values in the inner circle is completely multiplicative, then just the partial sums are unbounded. So partial sums of a complete multiplicative function taking values in the inner circle are unbounded, um, just because uh, yeah, uh, f of d can be factored out of, of, of this uh, sum in, in that case. Um, so, uh, so Erdős back in 1930, uh, uh, actually it appeared in 1950, he, but, uh, but uh, even then, so, so this, this special case was, was also open. Um, and it's not, it's not trivial. So for example, um, the fact that uh, this, if you sum the Lubo function plus minus one, that the, the partial sums are unbounded, this was known, but in order to, to do that, you needed to know that there was at least one non-trivial zero of the Riemann zeta function in the critical strip, uh, which is true, it's known, but that's not an obvious thing. Um, okay. Um, in fact, actually, uh, you can prove more. Because you have this arbitrary Hilbert space, uh, there's actually a, a slightly stronger corollary. Um, so that if f is not just a complete, mul well, if f is not a single mul multiplicative um, function, but it is a random complete multiplicative function. <coughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a random variable in the space of completely multiplicative functions from n to, to z. Um, then uh, if you take, uh, then if you, if you take these partial sums, which are now um, random variables, and take their, their variance, well, actually, the, the second moment, um, these guys are unbounded too. Uh, this is a, a, a generalization of this fact, um, and, and that is, again, a consequence of this theorem. But now the Hilbert space you take is the space of square integrable random variables. Um, so, uh, right, well, okay, I, I, won't, I won't go through it, but, but there's, there's a simple way to deduce this generalization from, from, from this. Um, okay, so now I can tell you one of the reasons why it was realized this problem is hard. Okay, so, um, so as a, if you solve the additional discrepancy problem, you must at some point be able to show that partial sums of multiplicative functions are unbounded. Um, on the other hand, we have these Dirichlet characters whose partial sums are bounded. Okay, like if you take this series of like one minus one, zero, one minus one, zero, one minus one, zero, that sequence is completely multiplicative and it is, the sums are bounded. So that's, that's almost a counterexample to the Erdős discrepancy problem, the, this, this sequence. The only reason that it's not is that it's got some zeros in it. Um, so you can try um, to get rid of these zeros. Um, so there's an example of Bowine, Choi, and Coons. So you, you, uh, you define a, a, fu a function f of n to be, um, OK, well, you define it like this. So uh, if uh, you, any number n you factor into a power of 3, times a number which is not divisible by 3. And you just factor the 3 out, and you, you, you take the Dirichlet character what's left. So you take any number, you factor out 3 until it's not divisible by 3, and then you pick either plus or minus 1, depending on, on whether what's left is either plus 1 or minus 1. OK, so uh, this is a sequence. So now this sequence is like the Dirichlet character, except that uh, instead of being 0 one third of the time, it is now always plus or minus 1. Um, so I think the sequence looks like this, plus 1, minus 1, and then you get another plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, then you get another plus one, so forth. Okay, this is a sequence that looks something like this. Um, so this sequence has a very low discrepancy. So it's completely multiplicative, takes values in plus or minus one, and uh, a fun little computation. If you, if you sum the, the partial sum, uh, this is the number of ones in the base three expansion. Okay, so it's a cute little uh, exercise. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so in particular, it's always bounded by log 3 of n. Um, so, this is a sequence of plus or minus ones which does have unbounded discrepancy. It is not a counterexample to the, um, uh, to the conjecture, but the discrepancy goes very slowly, it goes lo logarithmically, which, um, yeah. Um, you can play this example a little bit. Um, um, you can insert some random factor depending on a, and if, if you do that, you can, you can make the sequence. Uh, so there's a random sequence, and then you can make the uh, these um, um, the size of the sum not just log n but square root log n if, if you do it properly. Um, 
And so uh, actually, the discrepancy in these random examples, you can make grow as slowly as, as log squared or log n, which actually kind of fits actually with the numerical data that we've been getting as to how slowly the, uh, the numerics, uh, uh, the C has been growing. So uh, the thing is, uh, it, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, somewhat, it's only just barely um, true, this, this, uh, uh, this conjecture, that there are sequences which have very low discrepancy but not quite bounded. And so there's, there's a fine uh, separation between, between boundedness and unboundedness. OK, so one of the things, so uh, I told you about these co corollaries of the Erdrich discrepancy theorem. Um, so one of the amazing, the, the first breakthrough was by Polymath, um, who showed that not only is this a corollary of theorem 1, but it's actually equivalent. So this is quite amazing, actually, because um, this is a, a sequence. This is a theorem about arbitrary sequences of unit vectors, and this is a, a, a theorem about a very special type of sequence. Okay, random, but let's, let's ignore random. Okay, but it, the, the complete multiplicative sequence, which, which, are, which is a much rarer, much more special type of sequence. Um, and so it's it's actually quite amazing that um, that this is all you need. Um, but actually, once once you, once you you are inspired to look for this connection. This is actually not difficult to prove. It's a one-page proof. The, um, the basic idea is a Fourier expansion. So it turns out that so while not every function is, is completely multiplicative, a completely multiplicative function is actually, uh, if you think of it correctly, it's, it's a character on the multiplicative uh, semigroup um, of, of, of the uh, Natural numbers. Now that's not a group, so you have to you have to truncate it and, and, and massage it into a group. So there's, there's a slight tec a technicality there, but but morally, complete multiplicative functions are like characters, and you can uh, you can decompose any function f into a linear combination in principle of complete multiplicative functions as by some sort of Fourier decomposition, um, and uh, you apply Planck's theorem, and you follow your nose, uh, and actually. Um, yeah, so you, you, are, you are not, so any given function will not be a single um, uh, completely multiplicative function, but it will be some sort of superposition of completely multiplicative functions with some density, which will be square summable. Um, this, uh, this, um, this, the square of this density, that's, that's what um, gives you this random measure, which defines for you a, a, a random multiplicative function. And if you just play on Planck-Rose theorem a little bit, you will find that, that these are actually equivalent. Um, so it, it's not difficult, but I'm not going to, to give the details here. So roughly speaking, what the polymath project showed was that um, you basically, uh, roughly speaking, all you had to do was, was to understand completely multiplicative functions. And then if you do that, then, then, uh, then you'd be done. Um, and it was at that point that they ran, they ran into the problem that we really did not understand completely multiplicative functions very well in 2010. Um, and so the, they, they tried several other things which also uh, didn't work. And, and, and by 2012, they had abandoned the, the project. Um, Although they had some other very interesting approaches, which maybe will work one day. But um, okay, um, so <coughs> proving something is uh, proving these sums are unbounded is related to correlations. Uh, so um, it's closely related to the problem of understanding pair correlations between these functions. So uh, to illustrate this, let me give you um, a proof of a simple fact, which is uh, uh, the following. So if, if you take a rational number, rational real number. And you look at these partial sums, each the 2 pi i alpha j squared, j equals 1 to n. So sort of discrete Gauss sums. You're summing these, 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 these um, points in the unit circle going around quadratically in some, at some irrational rate here. Um, and you take these partial sums. These guys are unbounded. OK, that as you sum, uh, they become unbounded. Now, th this is kind of um, uh, not surprising because uh, you expect these to be these the sum to behave like n something n random things and if you add some n random things to size one you get something of size by root n, but what stops there being a huge conspiracy that every time you you know there's there's some really good cancellation some sort of sub random behavior um, that makes this bounded. Um, now you could break out your your, your you know high tech uh, analytic number theory and actually try to compute this sum and, and in this case you actually can uh, to some extent, um, but there's there's but if you just want to show it's unbounded. Um, uh, uh, you, you can argue as follows. Okay, so uh, suppose not. Okay, suppose that these sums are all somehow magically bounded. Um, so then what you do is that you, you, you pick, a, uh, pick a large H, you know, like a thousand, and then okay, and then randomly pick 
a huge n. Like somewhere between, so if h is like a thousand, pick n between a billion and a trillion or something. Right? So some, some really big random number. Okay. Now, um, if all the partial systems are bounded, okay, so this, this, is not a big, this is not a fully detailed proof, but uh, what you do is you take a short sum. Uh, you, you, you look at, um, um, okay, so it's e to 2 pi i, n plus j squared um, times alpha. You take a short segment of, of a partial sum between n and n plus h. So you just pick sort of a, a random medium-sized interval way out in the natural numbers. And if, if these guys are all bounded, then these guys also have to be all bounded because of the, the difference of two, of two partial sums. OK. So the thing is, if you, pick a, so you, uh, you think of h is fixed. You pick a large random number n. You're adding n random things. Okay? And, and each, so you, you can think of this as the sum of n random variables. Um, they, they each have magnitude 1, and I can mean it basically 0, uh, because alpha is irrational. Um, and you, you can show with uh, some simple computation if alpha is irrational. So you, you, can, you, can think of these as, as, uh, you can think of this as a sum, x1 plus up to xh, where these are all different random variables. Um, they all have mean 0, um, variance 1. And they are, um, they're, they're decoupled with each other. Um, you, you can show that the, the correlation between any two of these guys is small. Is small, just say small. Okay, that if you if you if you take this guy and you multiply by the conjugate of another quadratic thing, you, uh, the quadratic becomes cancel. You get a nice linear sum, and because alpha is irrational, you can easily show that this sum uh, is, is is very small on the average. So you are summing n random variables of variance one with, with, all, with almost no correlation between them, and therefore the variance of the sum is is something like h. And so I can make this sum, the variance of the sum, as a random variable, I can make as big as I like by making h as big as I like. And so I can make these sums as, as big as I, as I please. So there's a, a probabilistic argument uh, uh, based on pair correlations. Um, that if you know that pair correlations are small, then you can make, um, then you can make these sums unbounded. Um, you can think of this in the contrapositive. Uh, if these partial sums are bounded, then there must be some correlation between, there must be a conspiracy between uh, adjacent um, elements of your sequence. Uh, something must, um, must be non-random somehow to, um, must be some correlation if there is, uh, if you want to make these sums bounded. And so you can use that sort of argument, um, using this sort of argument, uh, you can show, if, if you have one of these multiplicative sequences, that if, 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 this sum is, if this sum is bounded, if these sums are bounded, then there are large correlations. Okay, so, so then there exists some shift h, so that if you look at a correlation, uh, something like this. Okay, that if, if you look at, at, at how um, a, tip, a random element in the sequence is, is correlated with, with the shift, then this has to be large, like bigger than some constant. Okay, so normally when you take, take a random looking sequence, uh, there should be no correlation between f of n and f of n plus h. Um, so if you could show, okay, so if you could show that, that these correlations are small, um, then you'd be done. You'd be able to, to prove the dis discrepancy problem. So the polymath project already got this far, um, but then they got stuck because um, even in the special case of the Louvo function, right, for example, if, if you wanted, okay, so, um, so, if you wanted to apply the strategy, you would have to take, you know, this had to work for any, any multiplicate function, so in particular the Louvre function. And you would, you would have to understand how the Louvre function correlated with, with uh, of n correlated with n plus one. And you would want this to somehow go to zero. Um, and this is conjecture to go to zero. Right? There's a conjecture of Chowler, it's called the Chowler conjecture. And same if you replace n plus one by other shifts, you can even have many lambdas in here and so forth. But there's a, there's a conjecture as to what these correlations are, they're all zero. Um, but this conjecture was considered extremely difficult. It, it's, it looks very similar to the twin prime conjecture. Right? Twin prime conjecture is, is about how many times you can make n and n plus two both prime. This is about how you can make n and n plus one um, both have even number of prime factors or odd number of prime factors. It was considered of equal difficulty to the um, uh, to the prime number uh, to uh, to the twin prime conjecture, which is still open. Um, so at this point, they said, "Oh, uh, uh, you would need, you know, uh, immense breakthroughs in, in number theory to, to advance further." And so the polymath project sort of stopped at this point, and we worked on, on other ways to attack the problem. Okay. Um, so in January of 2015, uh, there was uh, an amazing breakthrough by uh, Matamaki. 
two young people. She's in, she's in Finland, Kaisa at Matamaki, and Maxim Merzogol at Vatkis. Um, so um, uh, they didn't quite show the Chawla conjecture. Um, what they showed well, was something that looked a little bit different to begin with. Um, uh, okay, uh, let me phrase that like this. So that if you take h of medium size, uh, I'll phrase it somewhat, somewhat um, uh, roughly. So if you take h somewhat large, and n um, really large, or huge and random, okay, and you look at this partial sum, you sum, for example, the Louisville function, but it also works for other multiplicative functions, crucially. Uh, you, sum, you sum a block of the, of the Louisville function from 1 to h, some really large random block. Okay, so um, this, is clearly as, as, uh, this, is, this is clearly as big as h. Okay, so you, you could, you could this, this could all be plus 1, or be minus 1. So it could, it's clearly as big as h. But what they showed is that usually it's actually a bit less than h. Okay, that, that given any epsilon, you can make some less than a small multiple of h for, uh, for most n. Okay, now there's a lot of quantifiers which I'm suppressing, okay, to, to make the result <laughs> precise. But basically, they were able to show some cancellation in this sum. Um, so, um, right, so yeah, they, they, they showed this, and then la later I was able to, to, to work with them to improve this a little bit. You can also stick in some, some phases like this. Okay, do some other, play some other games like this um, using their method. Um, so yeah, so I won't talk about how, how they did this, but they, they used some they, they they used classical methods of Dirichlet series and complex analysis very cleverly um, and carefully. But um, but this was a, a great breakthrough. Um, so um, so I, 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 maybe in July or something. Um, no, uh, in September. Yeah. So I was I was um, I was working with uh, with, with Kaiser Matamaki and, and Maxim Ratzewell on this, and I I, I managed to use the, the theorem to prove some other things. We had some joint papers, and I, I put these joint papers on my blog, and I talked about them. Um, and at one point, I commented that um, uh, that uh, um, the type of arguments we were using to, to try to exploit these, these results reminded us of solving a Sudoku puzzle. The, 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 there was the, we were always playing these games of, you know, I want, I want these plus, plus one, you know, like, I, I don't want three plus ones in a row, and so, and so like, what kind of sign patterns can I, can I have over certain constraints? Um, and then someone on my blog who was active in the Polymath 5 projects said, you know, what you're talking about sounds very much like the type of things we were discussing in Polymath 5. Is there any chance that, that, uh, that, that these methods uh, could be used to attack the, uh, the discrepancy problem? Um, and so I applied saying, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> yeah, a bit naive. So the, the, the thing is, the um, Matamaki and Matsuo were proving upper bounds on things. So they were proving that these sums are, 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 are small. And what you wanted to prove was that certain sums were big. And so, so I knew this thought, you know, th th so therefore they're completely different problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I said this, it's a bit embarrassing, it's the comment is still there. Um, <laughs> but, um, but then someone else asked, actually, you know, uh, could, you know asked, repeated the question, could you say more about the possible connection? And so I actually looked back at it. And then, uh, and then I realized that actually there was something you can do because, um, um, <coughs> and so the, the original problem is an upper bound, but, but phrased in terms of correlations, um, you need to prove an upper bound on this correlation to prove a lower bound on, on, on the partial sums. And so you actually, it's actually much more plausible. Okay? What, what you need to do somehow is to be able to leverage this upper bound on, on the lower function to prove something like this upper bound, to prove some upper bound on, on, on this sort of sum. Um, now, um, that looked hard, but actually th this was something that actually uh, Keso and Maxime and I were actually thinking about a little bit. And we had an approach to this problem, which we also gave up on. Um, but now that I was motivated to go look at it, I, I sort of dusted it off. Um, so um, this looks hard. Um, because it's, it's, the thing is that um, it's very easy to think of a sequence for which the sum is, is very big. If, for example, the lambda is just alternate, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, and so forth. Um, and then the sum would, 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 be, would be huge. Um, now, that particular scenario can't happen, actually, because of, 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 uh, of, of, of the quantum work in Madsen. There's a, there's a version in arithmetic progressions that you can use. But um, there are other scenarios like this. This sum is somehow too, um, too easy to make big. Um, but there was a trick that we already saw to turn the sum into a sum that was less easy to make big. Um, but it could still be, we, we still couldn't stop it being big. Um, so, um, 
the key observation is that, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the enemy, let's just talk about the Louisville function, but uh, of course you have to do other functions as well eventually. Um, yeah, so, so the enemy uh, is, is the case where lambda n plus one, so equal to lambda n for many n. Okay, so you can have big stretches, and by, but, but uh, yeah, big stretches of, of space where, where the Louisville function has exactly the same sign. Um, now, um, what Matamaki and Matsu will show is, um, in, in what, one of the consequences of what they do is, is that uh, this can't happen, say, 99% of the time. Okay? That, that, um, but uh, what we need, actually, is that, uh, is that this can't happen 51% of the time. Um, and that, 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 was, that was, uh, seemed a lot harder. Okay, but if, um, yeah, so if, 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 if the Lou function had this sort of weird conspiracy to always to be locally constant uh, quite a lot, um, then because it's also multiplicative, you would also get um, that if you shift not by one, but by a prime, if you shift by a prime, this should also be, this should also be equal for many n divisible by prime. Okay, so if n is divisible by prime, um, so if n is like p times m, then uh, lambda p m is just the same as minus lambda of m, and this is minus lambda of m plus one. And we are assuming that lambda n plus one and lambda m are equal for many m, so therefore lambda n. Um, so um, what this suggests, actually, so then this is funny. Um, you can you can ex uh, exploit this graphically. So there's a certain graph on the nat natural numbers you can do, you can place, where you connect any point n with n plus p whenever p is divisible by n. Uh, p. Okay, so you connect everybody to the neighbor. Every even number gets connected to the guy two guys down, uh, two numbers down. Every multiple of three gets connected to um, something like that, and so on and so forth. So there's this infinite graph. And um, so this is infinite graph G. Um, and basically, uh, what you can show using this sort of analysis, roughly speaking, and lying a little bit, is that if, if this sum is large, then, um, okay, roughly speaking, that if, if you sum over all pairs in this graph, lambda of m, lambda m, this is also large. Okay, you have to truncate the graph in a certain way, and I'm not going to talk about how you, how you do that. But um, um, you, can, you can sum the Louisville function on this graph. So you, you take all the edges of this graph. Uh, for each edge of the graph, you evaluate the um, Louisville function at the two endpoints, multiply them together, sum that. And you can relate this bilinear sum to this sort of linear sort of sum because of the multiplicativity. So if this is large, then this is large. And so the, um, the hope, so uh, what's that? So, um, so then if you could show, okay, if G was an expander, you'd be done. Morally speaking, um, that there are these graphs called expanders, um, which uh, are so these these extremely connected graphs, which are which are very mixing in some sense. Um, and one of the properties of, of expander graphs is that is that uh, if you take um, any function of the, of one row of one edge vertex and any function of another, another vertex, and, and you sum along your expander graph, you will basically um, the sum will basically factor into into the sum of the, the mean value of this guy times the mean value of this guy. That is a they're very mixing, and the mean values of, of this lambda function are precisely what we now understand. Um, and so if you had um, some good expansion properties of this graph, um, you could actually um, you could actually finish finish the job and, and solve the problem. Um, so uh, yeah, so so we had this sort of plan to attack the Chalder conjecture, but then we got stuck because we had no clue how to prove this expander graph. Uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, it was it was it was it's very thin and and and, and uh, random walks on this graph are not easy to understand. Uh, well, they're easy to understand for short times, but not for long times and long times are what you need. Um, so anyway, we got stuck at this point. Um, but I started looking at this problem again a few weeks ago, and um, so uh, what, I, what I discovered was that this, this sum, um, so if, if you don't know that this is an expanded graph, it's still potentially possible that this sum is large. But, um, but what you can show without too much trouble is that even if the sum is, is, is large, it's, um, it's not. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so being an expander graph, uh, yeah, so, so being an expander, I haven't defined exactly what expander means, but roughly speaking, um, <coughs> being an expander graph 
means that a, a sum like this factors into basically the, um, a, a product of the individual sums, there's, there's some decoupling, for all choices of Okay, that's sort of roughly speaking what it means to be an expander. The, 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 um, there's, a formal, there's a formal version that's called the expander mixing lemma, but okay, um, if you know what that is. Um, and then if you have that, then you can just apply that to, to this, sort of, uh, this sort of sum and, and, and you, uh, you'll be done. Now, um, so we can't, I still don't know whether this is true. I, th I think that something like this is true, but I, I can't prove it. Um, but what, uh, what turns out to be um, a lot easier to prove um, and something I, I, uh, I can't realize this while I was waiting in the car for my, my son to finish his piano uh, lesson. I had nothing else to do, so I attacked this problem. Um, is that, um, is that what, what you can prove fairly easily is that um, for, for this funny graph, if you pick, um, so I don't know for, whether for all choices of, 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 of these signs you can get a bound like this, but for most choices, in fact, there's an exponentially small set of ex exceptions for which um, you can get a bound like this. That there's a, uh, you get mixing for most choices of of of, uh, of 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 inputs, but not all. Now this doesn't quite solve the problem because this sequence lambda could be um, could decide to 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 the, the 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 sign patterns of consecutive strings of lambda could decide to 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 live in the exponentially small set of of exceptions where this the sum fails. Um, so, um, but um, what I could then show, um, because using this fact, is that is that if um, if uh, uh, if this sum here was large, okay, then um, the sequence, uh, the, the sequence lambda one, lambda two, and so forth, uh, experiences um, okay a sizable drop, a significant drop. In Shannon entropy. Now I have to just get to tell you what I mean by this. Okay, so um, for any given h, if you pick a medium-sized h, like a thousand, you, you can pick up a large random. So you pick a medium-sized h, okay, and a large random n, and you can look at the sequence. This is sequence plus or minus ones, and you can look at the sequence in 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 the block from n plus one to n plus h. So you, you take a tiny, you take a medium-sized window of the movable sequence somewhere way out in the natural numbers, and that's some sequence of h plus ones and minus ones. So you can think of it as a random variable, a, a random string of plus ones and minus ones, taking values in minus, uh, taking values from minus one, um, uh, basically in the unit in the in the Hamming cube of, of the of size h. So um, that's a random variable, uh, which takes a discrete number of values, two to the h possible values. So it, ha it has a Shannon entropy. Every time you have a random variable, um, you can define a Shannon entropy. To be a sum over for all uh, um, outcomes, uh, p omega log one over p omega. Uh, p omega is uh, the probability that, that x is equal to omega. Okay, so you can talk about this random string, and you, you can compute its, en its entropy. So um, if uh, so, the conjecture is, is that the the, the Lubov function is spread uniformly, so that uh, the sign pattern should should be spread uniformly on the Hamming cube, and so the um, uh, the entropy here should actually be, be log of the size of the Hamming cube. Okay, so basically, if you use log base two, for example, it, it should be h. Okay, so um, you, you should take h, bit, h bits of information to um, to um, um, to to express a, a random block of, of, of h numbers in in, in the uh, in the Lubov sequence. Um, but what you can show, yeah, so so in, yeah, so in particular, if you take the normalized entropy, you take the entropy of a block of length h divided by h. This is somehow the uh, the compression rate. How, how much you can compress this this big string of plus and minus ones. So um, so if there's a lot of structure in the sequence, you, um, so th this is always the sum number between zero and one. It it decreases as h gets bigger. This is subadditivity, um, and so it it passes to a limit, which is what's, which is uh, which is called the entropy of, of the sequence, uh, common law of entropy of the sequence, common law of Sinai entropy. Um, but uh, and it still measures how how structured the sequence is. Um, but using this fact that this sum is, is true for all but an exponentially small set of exceptions, you can show that if this sum is bigger um, a lot of the time, then there's a drop in entropy. Well, what that means is, is that if you take a, a block of length h, and then you, you go up to a block of length, say, 10h, 
Um, the entropy, in principle, could be 10 times as big uh, for block of length 10H as it is for block of length H, but it actually drops a little bit. It's, it's, it, uh, the, uh, you, can, you, can, you can bound something like, like the entropy of, of, of the block of length 10H by 10 times the block of H minus something, minus, minus, minus a little bit, um, if the sum is large. Because the, the set of failures, okay, oops, that's, um, because saying that sum is large means that, means that lambda is living in a, in a, in a very un, uh, exponentially small set of, of possible sign patterns, and, and you can use that. Um, so every time that I can't prove my theorem, um, the entropy drops. Um, and the, the, there's a certain upper bound on the entropy, and so you can use the pigeonhole principle to say that eventually, as I keep expanding my blocks to be bigger and bigger, somewhere there is, uh, there is some block with it where I do not experience this drop in entropy. Um, and then that makes the sequence sort of uh, um, mixing in some sense in, at, at, that, at that scale. And then I can avoid this exponentially small set of, of, of uh, signs that I don't understand. And then that actually pr proves this theorem. Um, so to my knowledge, this is the first time where information theory, the Shannon and entropy inequalities were used to prove a theorem in number theory. Uh, uh, so I'm actually quite excited about this technique. I'm hoping we can, we can prove uh, other things in, uh, in number theory um, yes, uh, as well. Um, and, yeah, and, uh, and then, of course, there's the, there's the Erdrich problem, which, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, yeah, which was really nice to, to finally get solved. Um, I think uh, that is a good place to stop. Thank you.